I want to say a, a word of gratitude to Doris. Thank you very much for organizing this wonderful event. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Uh, you know, Hanukkah is one of the most important Jewish holidays. We all know the story, the oil, the eight days. That's, that's something that everybody knows. But there's a whole backstory behind it that people are not quite aware of. How did we get to this point of the Jews fighting the Greeks in a war and the temple was impure and they were looking for one jug of oil? How did we get to that point? Since when are Jews and Greeks at war? How did we, how did we get to this, this whole military conflict? So it's important to understand really the backstory of how we got to this miracle. And from that, we can really understand the real message of Hanukkah. Like, what is this about? What is the light of Hanukkah? What are we supposed to, what are we celebrating here? What are we commemorating? So a quick little history lesson. You remember Alexander the Great? Everybody remembers Alexander the Great? So he conquered much of the known world in the fourth century BCE. And he died very young. And when he died, his empire didn't stay together. It was split by his generals, by four of his generals into kind of four pieces. And one of his generals, was called, who was called Seleucus, he took the Middle Eastern part of the empire, Syria. So that's why we talk about Hanukkah as being having to do with the Syrian Greeks, the Seleucid Greeks. And another one of his generals, Ptolemy, took Egypt and Israel. Israel, that province of Judea, was appended to Egypt at the time. And originally we were part of that Egyptian Greek empire. And we actually had really good relations with the Greeks. Alexander the Great treated us well. You know, he exterminated many people, but he didn't touch the Jews. So we actually have had a very good relationship with Alexander the Great. He didn't actually harm the Jews. And uh, that re good positive relationship continued with Ptolemy and with the Egyptian Greeks. And then the Egyptian Greeks went to war with the Syrian Greeks about 150 years later. And the Syrian Greeks took over this territory between them, right? If you picture Egypt and Syria and Israel's right in between. So Antiochus III took over Judea and made it a part of his Syrian Greek uh, empire. And originally he treated the Jews well also, but his son, Antiochus IV, he had a different idea. Antiochus IV thought that he needs to unify his empire and get rid of all the different religions and just make everybody Greek. That was his vision. It was called Hellenism, right? Hellenism meant making everybody Hellenic. Hellenic means to be Greek. The Greeks don't call themselves Greeks. We call them Greeks. They call themselves Hellenes. All right? So Hellenic means to make everybody Greek. He wanted to make everybody the same. And so that's where he came to the Jews and said, okay, well, stop with all your silly rituals. You don't need all that stuff, all your traditions. You should be Greek like us. Right? Play sports like us. Come to the gymnasium. You know gymnasium? You know what gymnasium means in Greek? Anybody know the, the root of the word gym, gymnasium? Gymno? Anybody know what gymno means in Greek? Gymnastics. Gymnastic, but what does it mean? What what is gymna what is the root of the word gymnastics? Huh? Acrobat? Close, kind of. That's what we think it means. We think a gymnasium is a place to, you know, exercise and do sport. The Greek word gymno means naked. Naked. Because you would come to the gymnasium and you would undress and you would do your activities completely naked. Right? The Olympics were done totally naked, not even underwear. Right? It was just it was a highlight of the body. All that mattered was the beauty. Uh, and, you know, strength of the physical body, and the spiritual was not important to them, and the moral was not important to them. You know, the Greeks had all kinds of horrible practices. If you look at what the Greek philosopher said, say, if a baby is born and it's not perfect, it's not a perfect baby, if it has some defect, what did you do? They said they would expose it, it means they just throw it out, leave it in the forest somewhere. You don't like the baby, throw it out. They had this, they practiced infanticide. It was normal in Greek society, and all these other horrific things that the Greeks practiced very openly, and pedophilia was very uh, widespread. All, all kinds of horrible, immoral things that the Greeks did. It was all about the body. That's all they cared about. And the Jews, of course, was all about the soul. And so the Greeks started to impose all kinds of things. One of the first things they wanted to do away with was circumcision. Right? Don't touch the body. It's perfect. Leave it as is. Right? No circumcision. They banned circumcision. They banned certain things like Shabbat and our holidays because those are spiritual. Shabbat's a day for spirituality. Right? Not to focus on the physical world. Don't work physically, but rest. So they attacked all these things that were all about the soul. And it was all about making everybody Hellenic. And then they, the, the final kind of point came when they asked the Jews to sacrifice a pig in the temple. Right? To that extent. Right? Show us that you're loyal to the Greeks and sacrifice a pig for us. And unfortunately, there were many Jews who had assimilated, who had become like they're just like in the world today, unfortunately, where many Jews have lost their traditions, have lost their connection, 
and their identity as a Jew, and they're completely assimilated. And one of these Kohanim, one of the priests that was assimilated, agreed. He said, okay, we'll sacrifice a pig, what's the big deal? Right? In God's holy temple. And this is when Matityahu and his sons got up and said, they were Kohanim as well, they said, absolutely not. And this started a, an actual war. Originally, it was actually a civil war. It was a civil war between the traditional Jews, led by the Maccabees, by the Hashmonaim, their real, their family name was the Hashmonaim, and the Maccabee was the nickname of one of them, Yehuda, versus the Hellenized Jews. In fact, fun fact, that if anybody speaks Hebrew, how do you say in modern Hebrew, somebody who's secular? Anybody know? In modern Hebrew, how do you say secular? Chiloni. Chiloni. Right? What is a Chiloni? If you look at the word, it's literally a Heleni. Right? A Heleni. It's a Greek. That's a, the Hebrew word today in Israel, people who are proud, some of them are very proud to be secular. They say, I'm a proud Chiloni. They're really what they're saying is, I'm a proud Greek. <laughs> that's, what, that's what Chiloni means. A Heleni is a, is, a, is a Greek. So this was really, Hanukkah began as a civil war between the traditional Jews who wanted to maintain their Jewish identity versus the Hellenized Jews who had assimilated. And then when the traditional Jews were winning, the Greeks came and supported these Hellenized Jews, and then it became a full-scale war, and the Greeks sent all their forces, including war elephants. And one of the five sons of Matitel, one of those five Maccabees, actually was killed by a war elephant, by a Greek war elephant. He was trampled by the elephant. So it became a full-scale, a massive full-scale war. But as we know, the Jews ultimately won, and the Seleucid, the Seleucid uh, Greek Empire actually fell apart and was destroyed and the Jews were able to reestablish an independent state with their own kingdom, and then and we know the rest of the story, where the temple was finally purified and the miracle of the oil that happened afterwards. But the, the whole idea here is that the, the Greeks tried to stamp out the light of the Torah, the light of spirituality. The Greeks represent darkness. The Greeks represent darkness, and we, with our Hanukkah lights, are trying to bring the light back. I'll, I'll give you one last little insight. Uh, you know in the Torah, how does the Torah begin? Anybody remember? How does the Torah begin? The book of Genesis, Bereshit. What are the first words of the Torah? Bereshit, bara, elokim, et hashemayim, et aletz. God created the whole universe, the, the earth and the sky. And what's the next verse? Beha aletz, aita, tohu vavo, yefemel. Good. Bechoshech al pnei teom. Thank you. That's exactly the pasuk. What does that mean? Our sages say something really, there's four really unique words here. The second verse of the Torah says, the Ha'aretz and the earth, the universe, Aita Tohu Vavohu, was chaotic and void. This is a very unique word, Tohu and Vohu. And then it says, Bechoshech and darkness was upon the deep, Al Pnei Tehom. There's four unique words there, Tohu, Vohu, Choshech, and Tehom. And our sages say that the Torah from the very... And then water. That's right. But those four words at the very beginning, they have a little negative connotation. And our sages say already 2,000 years ago that what they represent, these four words, are the four great oppressors of the Jewish people. Who were the four great oppressors of the Jewish people? You remember? First was Egypt, but in Egypt we still were not the Jewish people. We became the Jewish people when we came out of Egypt and when we got the Torah at Sinai. So since we got the Torah at Sinai and became one unified Jewish nation, there were four great oppressors. The first, Bavel, that destroyed the first temple, and then Paras and then Yavan, the Greeks, and then the Romans who destroyed the second temple. So those four great oppressors of the Jewish people, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans, correspond to those four words in Bedashit. Yeah. Tohu and Vohu refers, refers to Babylon and Persia. And then what's the next word? Choshech. Choshech is the third oppressor, Yavan. So the Greeks, the Syrian Greeks, represented that darkness. They tried to put out our fire and our light. And so on Hanukkah, what we do is, of course, we reignite that light, and we bring that light to the world. Because that's our purpose. We've all heard this idea that the Jews are the chosen people. What does that mean that we're the chosen people? Chosen for what? And the Torah says we were chosen to be la or goim, to be a light unto the nations. We are supposed to be a light unto the nations. We're supposed to make the world a better place, to teach the world morality, justice, righteousness. And if you look at some of the leaders throughout history, the biggest leaders when, when it comes to making the world a better place, whether through technology or medicine or even socially, they were Jews. You know, if you like your uh, workers' rights, you, have, you like your pension plan, who are the people that came up with these ideas? They were Jews, like Samuel Gompers and Louis Brandeis, that fought for the average worker, that wanted to make weekends, that wanted to make health benefits and dental plans and pension plans. It was Jews that were behind that. 
And who were the Jews in the, the greatest of the great in physics and in science? The, we all know Albert Einstein and others. And all these incredible technological inventions, some of the first cancer treatments and antibiotics were, were discovered by Jews. Even the internet, one of the founders of the, one of the early figures in the development of the internet is Bob Kahn. They call him the father of the internet. The cell phone was invented by a Jew. Yeah. Right? So much of our technolo technologies yeah. and our medicines yeah. and all these scientific breakthroughs. Why are there so many Jews? You know, so close to a third of Nobel Prize winners are Jews. How does that happen? We're such a small nation. There's only maybe 15 million Jews on the planet, 0.2% of the world's population, but over 20% of the Nobel Prizes. How is that possible? Because God gave us this incredible gift. He, he told us that I'm making you a light unto the nations. You have the power to transform the world. And that's what we were put here to do, to bring that light to the world. We are the light to the nations, to be the old going. And that's really the light of Hanukkah. That's what we're commemorating and celebrating when we light the Hanukkah candles. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to light our candles. Today is when we started the fifth night, so we're going to have five candles. And you know, we make two blessings. On the first night, you make three blessings, because we do Sheikh Yanu, which we always say on a happy, on a, a case, special occasion. And then on the subsequent nights, we have two blessings. The first for the light of the Hanukkah uh, candles, and the second for the miracles that God did for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>